Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. Nathan Kohlerman, my good homie, I'm so stoked you are on the Soul Seeker podcast. I was going to say back again, but I don't remember if we've done this podcast or one of my older ones. It's, I mean, over 200 episodes, neither here nor there. You have a brand new book called your first book, published author, best-selling author. Congratulations. It's called Between Two Worlds, an atlas for navigating the complexities of life, death, and suicide. Nathan, welcome to the pod. Thank you, bro. Thanks for having me. Great to see your face, man. It's always good to see you, dude. You too, brother. Yeah, I was telling you, uh, or I guess I'll let the listeners know, I was reading this book before we hit record, I guess, uh, the past week or so. And I had a hard time choosing what topics to (laughs) write down for the podcast because it was just like, okay, this, that, this, that. And there's so many different things that I want to cover with you. But the first thing is for someone that you're just, it's just meeting you for the first time, they're just listening to you on this podcast and being introduced to you. How would you explain yourself if you just were like passing through an elevator and you only were had a minute to introduce yourself to someone? Be like, hey, my name is Nathan Kohlerman. I'm a father, an artist, an author, a speaker, and I inspire hope for those who are lost in their darkness. So let's unpack that right there. You inspire hope for those who are lost in the darkness. There's no way that you could inspire hope for others that are lost in the darkness if you haven't been in darkness yourself. Yeah. Where do you want to start? (laughs) I mean... I think I actually shared my story on on one of the previous episodes. So even if they find those between us, they'll see more in detail. But really for me, it's it's this last 31 years, right? Because I'm 31, 32 in July, still relatively young in the human experience. But I've lived a lot of lives. And some of those lives included being a gang member, a dope dealer, which is why now I'm a hope dealer, being in the in the gangs, in the military. That's how I got out of the gangs. That's how I got out of the dope. From there, I went into fitness and I went into bodybuilding. And the fitness industry is a very dark world. It's like this like deep underground like ring of validation, essentially, and bodily abuse and, and shame. And it just really wasn't a healthy trajectory for me. And once I started going deeper into my work, into myself, after all of these life experiences illuminated what wasn't being loved fully or accepted unconditionally, I started working with plant medicine. I started working with the shamans. I started working with the tribes and the indigenous cultures and the rituals and ceremonies that really allowed me to go into my darkness completely. And I'm not done yet, man. Like we were just talking about this before where I'm now just revealing new layers of it. And the aspect of darkness I speak of is the unconscious, right? Very much from Jung's work, Carl Jung. And looking at the collective unconscious, looking at the individuation unconscious, looking at the parts of myself that I don't know quite yet. And every single time I step into an experience or an opportunity to further know myself, that is just another step towards the darkness. So it's not necessarily like this darkness as in like an evil place or a place of pain. 
It's simply just the place that I have yet to discover because the darkness is where the light is found. And the purpose of darkness is to actually accentuate the potential of the light that exists within us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think shadow work or playing with the darkness, getting to know these unconscious um, behaviors, patterns, and parts of yourself, IFS, all this sort of stuff, it can start to feel like a slippery slope of just heaviness and denseness and like always doing the work and it's like whoa where's the time for play or like can't we just like it just like hang and not always like do these heavy things i think there's a misconception about like doing the work or darkness or shadow work any of these terms that needs to be dense and heavy you know i'm in a period i was mentioning this to you earlier before we hit record and we'll for sure riff on this uh both being authors with books out and how that affects do you uh, on a psychological level where you're no longer working on that creative expression and it is something with the end in mind even though we know it's about being present in the journey that said right now i am in a state where like before when I, my whole world was imploded last year which you and i spoke offline thank you for being there for me as a brother but uh that was actually easier for me given even though it was the hardest time in my life because i could look at that and be like all right it's game time let's go like this is why i learn about doing the work whereas like a creative expression of the book is almost like a loss of identity or purpose or like it's your creative expression you know i think i found these new creative expressions and getting excited about the darkness like what are your thoughts about like this energy of like oh i'm doing shadow work or it's hard or everything's hard right now like what do you think about that mm. i mean you spoke to it right it's it doesn't have to be heavy man you know it's like how many times have we gone into this place where it's like, oh, I got something to work on, right? There's something that I need to heal. There's something that I need to do. There's something that I need to fix. There's something that I need to mend that I feel is broken inside of me, right? Mm -hmm. And just the statement alone <laughs> to say that we need to work on something or fix something or heal something unconsciously inherently means that there's something broken or unworthy, or unlovable, or unseen that we feel the pressure to discover, right? There's almost like this unconscious pressure that happens to it. When in reality, like shadow work for me <laughs> is just being really still and not doing anything because I'm starting to realize how uncomfortable it is for me. And we were talking about this before how uncomfortable it is for me to not be moving at the pace that society set for me Yeah, to look at my life and be like, wow, I feel like life is just passing by. And then I'm, that's just from me sitting still for a day. And already these intrusive thoughts are like, whoa, dude, you're not moving fast enough. You're not going fast enough. You're not doing enough. You're not working enough. And what that exposes is my deep unconscious desire to achieve, right? or to produce, or to be the Messiah for other people, to have to save the world mm -hmm. and try so many times, and we said this before, try so many times to save the world when people don't even want to save themselves. All right, right there. Let's pause right there. And I, I want to unpack what you just said uh, in terms of people not wanting to save themselves. I was re-listening to Anatomy of the Spirit, or I think that's what it's called. It's a book by Carolyn Mace. You're familiar with her work. Yeah, Energy probably, Anatomy. Right? Energy Anatomy. Yeah, I didn't remember the title, but I was listening. It. And uh, a certain part came through and she was saying when people have this energy of wanting to save the world, or she might have said it in a different way. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but it's it's like my big grandiose mission to save the world. Like, why are all these hard things coming in my life? Well, look at your what your intention is. Look at what you're calling in, and that I found very uh, very fascinating because we don't think about that. And what I've thought about with like grandiose purpose and missions and things like that are like that kind of distracts us from really what we want in our life because I think it's almost in a way 
not to use the word narcissistic, but in a way it could be narcissistic to think that like, oh, hey, I have this grandiose purpose and I'm going like, yeah, we are the superhero of our own story, but right, we're not going to like change the world. And it's like if quantum physics teaches us that the outer world that we experience is a reflection of our inner world and our inner world is just a chaotic state of like needing to figure out our mission, needing to fill our, our purpose and mission and our dharma and all that. Yet we also know we shouldn't should on ourselves and put all this extra pressure then it's like, what are we doing here? So I think the spiritual community is like really misaligned. And that's my uh, my take on it. But you were about to talk about people that don't want to save themselves. Please unpack that a little bit. Yeah. You know, and, and you know, we've been coaching for a while, right? Like we've been in the game for a while. Whether I was working as a personal trainer or whether I was like doing like mindset and behavior change or if I was doing nutrition or you know, even more recently, if I'm doing more like trauma and somatic work, like a lot of people, what I've realized is this, this incessant and unconscious desire to like be saved by something, to think that if they do the breathwork session, then they'll be saved. To think that if they do the work, then someone will save them. Right. But the thing is, is when they're in this like performative aspect of repairing oneself, it's inherently seeking outward right? Again, and again, and again, when we don't really need those things, like we don't need those things. I'll be the first to say, like, you don't really need a coach, (laughs) Mm -hmm. right? Like where I'm at in my life right now is I need God. Like I need, I need source, spirit, higher power, whatever universal pronoun you want to use for this thing. But that's what I need most. And I don't ask God to save me right? I don't just pray in my low moments. I pray for the thing that I desire to achieve within myself without the approval of anything or anyone outside of myself. And that to me is what I would define as saving oneself is to really ask through a direct request, AKA prayer for something that we have yet to see within ourselves. So that way we can offer that freely as it was freely given to us. And that's a concept that's taught in the rooms of recovery. In AACANA, one of the principles is to give freely what was once given freely to us. So why in these transactional moments of, we'll call it coaching, consulting, guiding, mentoring, which yes, they do provide value and there is a time and place, right? But at what point do we say, I've done enough, I've invested enough, and now I get to sit back and pause and be still and integrate the divine order that already exists within me, and that is the point of existing. And that in itself is actually saving oneself, to actually sit and pause instead of this incessant grasping for for something outside of oneself. And it is counterintuitive as a coach and consultant. And sure, I might be shooting myself in the foot when it comes to business, but I don't care. (laughs) Yeah, I I actually don't think it is. You know, to me, I'm like, as a coach, I think of myself as a guide more. You know, I usually use the word coach versus guide because it's more understood by most people. I try to have a conversation when I first am working with someone to be like, I, you all, not everything's going to change just because you're coaching with me. Like I'm here to help guide you to get to those answers within yourself. That's what we're here for, to teach you the tools that have worked for us that we've learned from other people and pass it on, right? And at the end of the day, like we need to find that within ourselves. And if we have a client or any coach has a client just coming in like, oh, please, uh, just uh, I paid you the money. So now everything's good. You know, like, let's go. A part of the reason why I launched my marketing agency before I got into spiritual coaching was my work with you and other people when I was teaching entrepreneurs to scale their business with freelancers. You were doing the work, but I had a lot of clients who I would coach on how to scale their business working with virtual assistants and freelancers, and they wouldn't do the work. And I'm like, okay, why am I doing this then? So then I create a done for you agency, which is very different because that's a business thing. We can't have a done for you healing 
offer, right? You know, like even a medicine journeys, aim the stuff like you got to surrender. And I'm sure you see it in your networks as well, but there's a lot of people in the medicine communities. That means working with psychedelic therapy um, that just look at doing this ceremony and being like, oh, I'm going to circle this and that's going to fix me. And then they leave and be like, yeah, it didn't work. I'm just like, what do you mean? Like, I wouldn't say this, but I'm thinking in my head, like, what do you mean it didn't work? It's like it didn't work or you didn't put in the work afterwards. Yeah. There's a difference. Yeah, yeah. Which reminds me of something you said in your book that I quote on LinkedIn. It's um, the going, uh, uh, the way out, say that, the, the way out is within. Yeah, the way out is not through, it is from within. So unpack that, because I think that's a really bold, amazing statement. Yeah, I mean, when we say like, the only way out is through, you know, that's like that white knuckle mentality that like our fathers and our fathers before us would say, and sometimes our mothers and mothers before us would say. But really, when I sit back and think about it, it's like, dude, I've been white knuckling my entire life. Like just getting through something to get through something, like to move through something just to say I was able to move through it, just to feed my ego's ability to say, yeah, I superseded my shadow. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm the one in control, right? I'm the one with the power, right? But like power isn't given. Power is you. You are power, right? It's not something we take. It's not something we give away. It's something that we're inherently born with. Mm -hmm. Right? So why would we have to reinforce to ourselves that we can get through it, right? The only way out is through. No, the only way out is within. Because when you look at, right, quantum physics, laws of the universe, right? As above, so below. As without, so within. As within, so without. So wouldn't it be true that the only way out is in? <laughs> if the universal principles in, in, in and of themselves are the guiding principles of what we would call expansion, ascension, enlightenment. So why would we have to think that the way out is through? Because that's only creating further separation and division from our soul. I I, I agree wholeheartedly. I'm just opening up your book right here for the notes because that makes me think of the nine principles for navigating darkness that you have because I would imagine that those nine principles would be kind of the atlas to help someone navigate uh, how to actually go within because the next logical question is like, well, I've been trying to do the work. I've done all of these things, but nothing's working. And I'm just stuck. Is that when you would recommend these uh, nine tools? Uh oh, you're on mute, mute. Nine principles. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, so they're not necessarily right tools, right? But like principles, right? Yeah. Because principles are subjective. That's why that's why they're principles. Because the way I view principles is that they are the temperaments, right? And that's actually where I extracted those nine principles. Were from the nine temperaments that every child needs and forms through the formation of the personality. And what we're really doing when we're navigating these nine principles is that we're subjectively as an adult through the adult's eyes, being able to repattern and reparent our child. And these are quite literally the, the very same principles that allow us to be a more aware, mindful, loving human, right? When we talk about presence being the first one, it's really what allows us to interact with our heart. When we talk about focus, it's about interacting with the world with through our mind. Responsibility is the ability to respond when we are confronted with complexity. Familiarity, when we can start seeing what's familiar. Because if we don't identify what's familiar, we're never going to recognize what our actual pattern is. Because humans, at least from my perspective, have a series of choices. And they prioritize these choices. And the first priority is normally familiarity. We will always choose what's familiar in the body. And this is my background from biomechanics and neuromuscular therapy and whatnot, is that the body will always take the path of least resistance. So if you squat, the body will take the path of least resistance. So when we recognize familiarity, it's actually the awareness and the opening to choose what's uncomfortable. And then to make those choices, we need range, which is that fifth principle. And range is the ability to assess how gentle or how assertive does this action need to be? And how can I give myself permission to move through the resistance in either or, both and, versus this or that? This and that, 
And either this might require something more gentle for the situation at hand. And that's where we look at attachment number six. Like what is our attachment to the outcome of this action, whether how gentle or how assertive? And then how can we be adaptable to, to the change of environment once we make that choice? And through the continued effort, we then form endurance, which is eight. And then from endurance, we actually uh, develop agility. Because when we're strong, we also start forming this unconscious pattern of agility to navigate all of these different realms of life. So really, when you look at the nine principles, it's also a list of priorities. It's literally where to start. Be present with the heart, be present with the mind, then start assessing, discerning, and taking actions and forming these unconscious behaviors in a more conscious way in a more mindful way. And from that, it's not necessarily the answer because these are very subjective, but their perspectives and how one might be able to look at themselves a little bit more truthfully, because that's really what the entire section of death is built on is safety, love, truth, and freedom. And that's why it follows those four chapters of safety, love, truth, and freedom. Because once we assess those four things or determine what those four things mean to us in our darkest of moments, we now have awareness of where we're at and the principles provide a roadmap for where we want to go. So if I'm hearing you right with safety, love, truth, and freedom, when we're navigating darkness, if we can use those as our pillars, that's going to be a good anchor. Yeah, because safety, love, truth, and freedom are what we reveal and what we attain in darkness. Those are okay, the so, offerings of darkness. And these are like the four themes of the nine principles, if you will. Right. right? Yeah. Right. It, it's, I'm doing something so similar with my six step breath process. I have like three themes of the six steps. It's, it's cool to see this and unpack it, but safety, love, truth, and freedom. So starting off, like, cause I, I work with a lot of people that are going through dark night of the souls. I know a lot of people listening to this podcast, right. And the dark night, you know, I think it's a, we all know this. If you're someone who is uses the term dark night of the soul, I would hope that you know this, but if you haven't heard the term, know that it's not a night and there is no uh, guarantee of how long it's going to last. And I'm personally of the belief if it's like six months or longer, like I would even say a couple months, but definitely six months or longer, like you're, I could say this more gently, but I'm just going to be blunt. You're probably doing something wrong, you know, just to be straight up, right? Because it shouldn't last that long. We're not fully surrendering to the darkness. If we're navigating something for six months and we're still in this story of like, yes, it's so tough. It's so hard. It's so heavy. It's so dense. I can't get over this grief or this rage or whatever the thing is. Like, what do you think about that? Yeah, man. I mean, when it comes to the dark night of the soul, and I'm sure you're already familiar, but it normally breaks down in five different stages. Number one, an event happens, right? So there's a death, there's a breakup. And then we have the second event, which is the breakdown or the second phase, which is the breakdown. And that's where we start experiencing the effects of that event. And then in the third, we have our purge, right? So like the event happens, the breakdown, the purge, we start crying, right? Those first three things can happen within minutes. And then what happens is that we move into the void, right? And that void is that area of darkness. And that's why our, where it kind of correlates to the safety, love, truth, and freedom, and the nine principles. And then once we get really clear on that, because we do need clarity and certainty before we actually find safety and significance, which happens in the integration. And when we look at that, like, can we put a time limit on that? I personally don't think so. Because it's the spiral nature of our human experience, man. You know, there is a time where I think if you're well equipped, well resourced, and well supported, six months, absolutely. And most people don't have that, right? Like a lot of people don't have that. So there is some grace there. What I would say is if you're not making progress in six months, then you're either not well equipped, not well resourced or you don't have the adequate necessary support. 
And that is the invitation that if maybe you don't get that in that six months, it's to start asking, right? It's not what am I doing wrong? It's what am I missing or who am I missing? Mm, yeah, I like, I like that. Well you said. Know what I mean, so yeah, then, then it becomes this exercise of knowingness, right? Versus judgment. And it's like, well, I actually know that I'm not where I want to be. And I have the ability to both command and surrender to know that these three things are fundamental in me making progress. So where do I need to go? Who do I need to talk to? What do I need to know and learn and maybe even obtain so that way I can navigate this process more truthfully, right? I would say if somebody's not there in six months, they're not being honest with themselves. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's kind of what we talked about with like people who don't want to be saved or people who are not being honest, mm -hmm. right? People who don't want to be saved are not owning their experience. So therefore they, they seek to have others own their experience for them or guide them. And, and that becomes what we would call codependency. Right. I, I know for me when I'm in a dark night and I've kind of been in and out recently, but that's why I'm like passionate about it and I can see it in myself as well. Right. So it kind of, it comes up bubbling. Cause it's also being like, oh, okay, this is where you're not in alignment, Sam. Right. You know, and there's been plenty of times where I've been stuck in a story of like, yeah, I'm currently going through it. And like, that's one of the worst things we can do because all we have is this moment now. And now we're just replaying the story of the past. And I can't tell you how many times I've just felt like stuck or in it or whatever, but then around me, I'm, I don't know if I'm the only one that feels this way. I feel like you'd probably feel this way too, but like everything in me wants to be like, I'm good. I, I, I'm great. I feel <laughs> awesome. But I've been so stuck in this narrative of like, oh, I feel terrible. It's like, I just don't know how to be happy anymore. You know, mm -hmm. dude, I'm literally going through that right now. <laughs> like, all right let, let's talk about it. enough teasing and dancing around it so you published your book your first book congratulations a huge feat uh we can uh, get into uh, more of the book or the writing process because it was really cool to watch on social media your writing process you uh, process you did a whole immersive like in person with a coach there you go uh, see coaches do have a use but tell us since the book has been published how have you been feeling man i mean like you just said i just felt like i've been in it like i've been going through it and i'm having to like read my book and remind myself that i don't have to go through anything i really just get to sit here and be with this unfamiliar experience right because i was explaining to you like i've always seen publishing a book or speaking on stage being like the pinnacle of a coach's experience or the pinnacle of a coach's career and then i'm like shit like there's a much higher level of accountability. There's a much higher level of standards. There's a much higher level of ownership and integrity that has to be with this. And it's been really uncomfortable making a really honest inventory in myself. And when I say taking an honest inventory of myself, I'm really looking at these parts where I'm not living up to my own expectations. I'm not living up to the standard of the author who wrote the book. I'm not living up to the standard of the father I claim to be. And I'm being radically honest with myself. And that's what the hard part is, is like Nathan Kohlerman may be on the cover, but God worked through Nathan Kohlerman to bring these words on the page. Mm. That wasn't really me. That's the way I'm looking at it. That wasn't me. That was God moving through me. Like the, coach I hired and publisher she's a book medium like she was there as a support getting visions and you know asking me questions and through the questions I dropped in and started moving this communication through me and some words that I was speaking some words that I was writing are words I've never used before mm -hmm. some metaphors and some some visuals and some distinctions that I was making I've never even considered consciously until I sat down and the book was in front of me to write Right. And so that's why I say like, it wasn't really me. It was God moving through me. And now that it's in my hands, right. Because God was just like, yo, these are the things that you need more most. Like these are the things that you need as Nathan Kohlerman to live experience and embody if you really want to change the world. And having to look at that now has been gut wrenching. 
because I really am being truthful and honest with myself, right? All the things that I'm talking about are the very things I'm pondering in real time. It's not that I'm above or holier than thou, like we were talking about this, like narcissistic self who feels as though like I'm the one to pursue this mission, to bring change to the world, right? And through the narcissist is also the leader, right? It's like the psychopath. It's the leader archetype. And this is referencing Wilhelm Reich's work with characterology and like somatic armory. So when I start to look at all of these different shadows of, of narcissism and shadows of psychopathy and shadows of myself, I'm really having to get truthful and honest and radically, radically honest, <laughs> radically truthful, because there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. I like this book is going to be on the planet in the world for the rest of time. So now my mission is to live up to the expectation that those who read the book, even after I die, still see me as someone who helped change the world or helped make the world a little bit better of a place. Like I, I put this thing out and then I'm like, wow, now is the time to get really real with myself. Not that I haven't been up until this point. I've been real with myself to a certain level. And now there's an additional higher level of accountability that happens. Because I really do want to do great things. I really do want to change the world. I really do want to help as many people as possible. And that requires and simultaneously demands a standard that I have never known before. And because of that, I'm looking at this hill, right? Like I just climbed a mountain just to see like Machu Picchu, that there's a bigger mountain above it <laughs> and it's in the clouds and I can't see the top. And I have to be willing to make the pilgrimage and just trust that God knows what is up there for me. And this is like the greatest level of trust that I've ever experienced. And it is so fucking hard. It is so hard because the, the Nathan Kohlerman I know or knew only trusted that himself, right? Like I only trusted myself. It's still really hard for me to trust people. I've lived with the story and I've run the story that respect is, is, is given and trust is earned. And that's pretty detrimental when you talk about human connection <laughs> and there's a discernment to it. So it's this constant game in my, in my mind, right? That's what it feels like. It's like, I'm in, I'm in like Grand Theft Auto in Nathan's mind. <laughs> and it's like, I'm, I'm going to like help the lady across the street, but then I'm simultaneously like blasting a shotgun at a helicopter. <laughs> right? Right. And that's how it's felt. It's like this, this duality and this polarity and this like simulation that I've been in. And I'm like, what is life anymore? Right. I'm quite literally in the void, right? Almost like in that dark night of the soul. It's almost like the book was the dark night of the soul. It's almost like me putting pen on paper was the purge. And now that there's all of this purge that happened inside of the book, it's like, now I'm in this like empty space, this unknown, this like realm of possibility. And it's both exciting and terrifying. It's both exciting and terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I, it can definitely be uh, both. You know, the concept of the infinite game finally landed with me just a week or two ago, just finally. And I haven't actually dove into Simon Sinek's work with the infinite game. But back in the day, I was a big fan of his with Start With Why. And I think his other book was Know Your Why or something. He had two books on why. And I was such a big Simon Sinek fan. And around the time, I think that's the name of his new book, The Infinite Game. But I've heard him speak about it and other people reference it and him be interviewed. And it, it's just become so clear to me recently. Like that is something I need to go down next because i'm kind of that same spot with you with my current book and it's almost like the what to do next and what i was starting to tell you before was what brought me on this journey was this mindset of when i it was a subconscious mindset when i achieve abc i will feel xyz right and that's what you and i it kind of sounds like we're doing right now being like oh like i looked at this as the end destination same thing with me like when i'm named to silicon valley's 40 under 40 list when i build a million dollar business and it's like well we, we gotta go 
further for me it's not so much about like the distinguishment but what blew my mind in my yoga teacher training was the concept of sadhana and dakota mm. shea one of my instructors he said to name your ultimate potential is to limit your ultimate potential and yeah that blew oh. my mind is that good yeah dude that just hit me right in the neck yeah, I, I figured that was one that you might need to hear right now because it's not about like, at least for me, it could be for you, but it's not climbing like a Mount Machu Picchu or any other, uh, anything else. And then being like, oh, there's something bigger. It's that infinite being like, it's the ultimate potential. And we're not going to name that thing. And the sadhana is how mm -hmm. we are present in the journey. So I know for me, one thing I'm trying to get back to is writing just for writing because like it did feel very cathartic to write. And I had the book channel through me and I, I've written five books before this and I didn't really experience that feeling in the other books. This one, the first half to three quarters, it very much like how you were saying. And that was an amazing feeling. And it's interesting going back and reading those words to your point and be like, I wrote that. Uh, and another thing that came through when you were speaking was um, like how it was channeled and maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome or whatever, but what a gift though, because now that you're speaking and you're teaching the tools from this book, you get to maybe not quote unquote master it, but like you, it's your Dharma in the current, current moment iteration of your life, the chapter of your life to really learn it so well that it becomes ingrained in you. So you can live it and then teach it, you know? Yeah. That's the biggest thing. And even as we're literally talking about this right now, it's just like revealing itself to me, right? Like when I came into this podcast, right before we were talking, before I came on, I was like, man, I'm kind of on this, like, what's next? What's now? Right. And you reminded me that it's just the beginning and it quite literally is. And I'm just realizing that in real time right now, like, right. it's like, Here's oh, actually I get to live this book. Yeah. I get to actually live it. Right putting it out, publishing it, selling it, all this stuff is one thing, but living it like that's the journey, like this infinite game, man, I'm getting so much from this right now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is real time, everybody. I'm having <laughs> such a breakthrough in this moment. <laughs> Hell yeah. That's the thing, right? It's like, man, like that's that higher level of accountability. It's like, if I'm stepping on stages, if I'm working with people, if I'm sharing these tools, if I'm sharing these gifts, if I'm sharing this message, like, it's because I want to live it so badly, right? Like this kind of refers to the notion that we find the work that we need the most, right? Like that's the first thing that comes to mind. And like even Nicole LaPera, like holistic psychologist on Instagram, she goes, becoming a therapist is my trauma response. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit. But I really like what you said, like you're getting back to writing just to write. And that's what I used to love to do. And I've been like, I haven't been writing. I like publish the book and I'm like, I'm not writing ever again. <laughs> like the stubborn, like Nathan, you need to go do something new. You need to do something unique. You need to do something that's going to level you up more instead of just writing to write. Right. Like I just started writing poetry again. And I'm like, man, finally, because that's literally how this like writing style was formed. Like I, I call the writing style in the book, like, what did I call it? It was like neo mythological, like neo mythic poetry. It's like neo mythic poetry to where it's, it's like dark poetry. It's dark artistry. It's psychological soothing for the soul. Mm -hmm. right? And the way that I've written that, like I've been trying to mimic it, but instead of trying to mimic it, now I'm receiving an invitation to like, just write and find this like integrated aspect of who I am now right? To bring that writing into a new form, into a new thing. And that's probably going to be my, ne my next book, honestly, is a poetry book, because that is really what I love to do. Like, I love to create art. That's why I said, I'm like, I'm an artist, like a wordsmith. And, and there's just such, there's such a reward for just being able to put words to things that some people cannot understand. Right. And, and that words, and this is some feedback that I've already gotten, like, Nathan, the way you wrote this is the exact thing I've been going through, moving through, experiencing, but I haven't been able to put words to it. Yeah. And, but you, the way you articulate it, like that's exactly how I'm feeling. And I haven't been able to do that for myself. And what a gift that is, right? To like help someone find the words to 
communicate their experience to someone they love, to, to communicate something to the world that needs to be heard. Like what a fucking gift. And, and now I get to be that I get to live that like how cool, right? And I'm sure how you experience cool. the same. <laughs> how cool is right. I mean, you're, you have some grace for yourself, you know, invitation for that at least because your book was published two to three weeks ago, a week ago, something like that. Right. First. <laughs> yeah. So at the time of this recording, like nine days ago, pretty much, I mean, it's a baby. It was just born. There's going to be so much growth that happens as a res result of this and getting that feedback, like you just shared, like, that's the thing that keeps us going as authors or as speakers, when we start to hear, because sometimes it, it feels like it's a one way path when doing a podcast or even speaking on stage or writing a book and be like, is this even landing for anyone? And then you go on social media and you start to compare your engagement to other people. And you'd be like, well, my engagement's dropping. Is it the algorithm? Is it, I'm saying the same type of stuff is, am I, are people getting tired of what I'm saying? And we get stuck in our mind. Like, is this even resonating? Is this even helping? So it's the book where I, found like podcasting for the past five years and writing five books six now and even doing some stuff on youtube and other stuff it's the book it's the book more than any other form of content where people come back and they're going back man that really helped that really landed with me uh just how you shared that and that's the thing where we can just be like all right we are making a difference because there is this part to sharing our art and James McRae, he's going to come on the pod. I think he wrote the book, uh, the art of you and a few others. What's his Instagram handle words are vibrations. He's got, he's big, dope. I love his page. Yeah. His, yeah. He's really good. What was I going to say about him? Yeah. He talks about in his latest book, the art of you, um, how as artists we need to share our work. And I think that's where, I get stuck and probably you as well. And a lot of artists do is like, we don't actually want to share it. Like we want to be making it and then we want to do it. And then all of a sudden, like, I know for me, I can speak to me. Like now I'm shifting into this like promotion energy of like, Hey, here's my book. And I'm like, okay, well maybe the engagement is down because I'm being inauthentic because I'm showing up the way I think I should show up. But I'm also like, I don't know the way to show up because I just want to tell you guys like, Hey, my book's out, check it out. You know, this resonates so hard. I'm just over here right. laughing because cause I'm like, Oh, I want to do like a reel and I should make like a post and I should do this and I should do this. I just keep shooting on myself. Right. But I'm like, yeah. I wrote the thing. Why do I have to do this? I'm like a little kid throwing a temper tantrum. I'm like, why can't somebody just post for me and do all this stuff? Like, <laughs> And see, that's the interesting thing in terms of the shadow work to be like, your whole message is like, no one can do the work for you <laughs> and then manifesting in a different kind of way, a business kind of way and being, Oh, Hey, what up? And that's where I'm like, yeah, make a game out of it. You know? And then it becomes kind of fun versus yeah, like, who thought it, I'm would doing be. it again. And then we get all down on ourselves about it and we shame ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Like how, how ironic is it that like shadow work is like make, making a social media post, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like playing the game of the simulation of the society is actually shadow work, right? To actually be aware of the simulation and then choose to play it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the greatest irony of all time, I think. And it's, it's, it's in real time. Like people are hearing this right now. This is real time. Like I'm literally like this, like child in me is like, ah, do it. Like this kid inside of me is just like, mom, dad, can't you just do it for me? Shit. Like, you know, like high school, Nathan, like paying smarter kids to like do his homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's well, like I mean the recognition that it's mine to do, right. It's my responsibility to carry it in the world. And like, I get to own that. Like how beautiful. And when and we challenging. When we create the micro content, we start to learn it more because we really learn by teaching, you know, and I, I there's so, been so many times here where I'm like, oh, I won't want to bring this up. I'm like, OK, just stay on this thread because this is good. Um, but at some point, I do want to get into breath work and your your how you lead breath work, because I'm just curious. You and I have never talked about that. And we're trained in the same time i i guess we'll just talk about it right now why not uh so somatic breath work we were both trained in somatic breath work are you still doing a lot of breath work journeys for folks oh yeah i'll do it on retreats and i'll do it with teams and i've kind of moved more in the direction of creating it as a like an integrated offer into something mm -hmm. so if i get asked to speak at an event 
or something of that nature, then I'll actually offer like, Hey, right. You want me to speak? Cool. Like I want to do a breathwork session because the breathwork session that I designed and the, the formula and the, st the structure of it coincides perfectly to my talk. So I've oh, kind cool. of now brought my speaking and my, and my breath work together to where they get to have a felt experience. And then also like a scene and, and a, and a heard experience through speaking. Yeah, I think that's awesome. You know, I'm doing the same thing where it's like I've learned these different modalities and been trained in them. And I'm like, I'm just doing it my way, <laughs> you know, like because it resonates more versus do the cookie cutter way. So uh, share with us uh, how you've been uh, leading breath work along with your speaking and these different experiences. Yeah. So my main talk that I've been delivering has been Darkness to Dharma. And it consists of five rounds, just as, you know, somatic breath work. Shout out to Jaggers you know, teaches in the, in the formula and the template. And what I've done is I've kind of shifted the dynamic of the breathing, right? So it has a lot more of like titration, pendulation, much of what Peter Levine talks about in somatic experiencing. So I brought some of these therapeutic tools that I use with clients into the sessions where the first session or the first round isn't even deep breathing, right? It's actually just a connection and a titration and a pendulum swing. It's going from soft and gentle to assertive and rough. And what happens is it becomes someone's own experience. And that's what I like to say in the first round. It's like, this is an opportunity for you to establish the intensity, capacity, and pace, right? Which are the three things, size, strength, and speed, three S's of semantics. You can determine how big of an experience you want, how fast of an experience you want, and how intense of an experience you want. And now it becomes your own journey. So in the second and third round, it's more of the deeper mouth breathing, right? Holotropic style, circular style. And what happens is that there are so many different experiences happening in the room, right? The room no longer becomes this, what I consider to be like a cathartic mess. It actually becomes this mm -hmm. beautiful um, synchronistic experience where the people who are popping off, we would call it, are kind of in one corner. And then the people who are maybe navigating a more silent, gentle journey are on the exact opposite. And there's all these different flavors and textures in between to where when I'm navigating it, I'm actually being able to just walk around the perimeter now to where I don't really do much hands-on anymore because the experience, the way I've built it has kind of exposed itself. And, and the purpose is in those first two rounds of the deeper breathing to go into their darkness. And then we shift into more of a nasal breathing and a more of a parasympathetic mode where people are relaxing into the experience, relaxing into the insights, relaxing into the awareness that they have to then find the Dharma within their darkness, to find the purpose in their pain, to find the light in their shadow. And through that experience, they get to have these magnificent revolutions, revelations, in which then when I deliver my talk, it kind of all makes sense. And they're like, whoa, I actually remember the point in my breath work where I had the purge. I actually remember the point in my breath work where I had the void. And I remember the point in my breath work where this thing happened and I was able to move through it without any words, without any therapy, without any context. I was just able to feel it and experience it and move forward with my life. And now it's making sense of what happened, right? So people experience it, but then they make sense of it. And then they're like, whoa, that's cool, right? And so the way I've been doing it has been kind of this darkness to Dharma, right? And, and that allows somebody to find light even in their darkest of moments, because we know in breath work things that can happen, right? Like repressed memories, re-experiencing traumatic things that have happened that just like overall summon appear. You have people dissociating, like not breathing. You have people convulsing and like all kinds of things can happen in that space. So the way I've constructed it is a lot more of a soothing experience. It's a lot more gentle, right? I would say it's more shamanic in nature because it is more of a journey than just an explosion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Because those tend to happen in the bigger experiences. And I don't really ever do bigger sessions, bigger experiences now, because I want to ensure that, right? Safety is the paramount feature, right? Like safety and connection are the paramount features. Not to say they aren't in bigger experiences, it just requires a lot more work. It takes a lot more awareness and a lot more um, people, right? And it's challenging 
to 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 only solely do breath work now because of all the other things, right? Mm. So if I am going to be doing things now, it is an integrated experience. It's a holistic connective experience where you have the felt experience, you have the talk, you have the book, and now all of those things put together can actually be all that someone needs to receive transformation. Absolutely. And that's the way I've personally structured it. No, I love that. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing that. And what sorts of uh, organizations are you speaking to when you do your talks and combine it with breath work? Yeah. So like the main one that I've been working with are groups of entrepreneurs who are building their business with the base of spirituality. Hmm. And those groups have been super powerful because they recognize that they are not their business, but they need to be at a certain point within themselves to carry their mission forward. So it allows them to go within and really reveal the things that they're not addressing. So that way, when they are showing up in their businesses, they're showing up even more powerfully. They're showing up even more connected. They're showing up even more in their heart and in their purpose to where they're not so much in their head, right? Because there's so many entrepreneurs who build businesses from their head, but it has nothing to do with that. Like your head is just the executive function that puts things into place that takes things from ideas to execution. But if your heart isn't in it, it doesn't fucking matter what business you build, right? So really I'm connecting entrepreneurs to their hearts through these experiences. And, and that's been the main that. demographic that I've been working with. That's really cool. That's powerful. And are these groups that you're working with, would you say like they've been into spirituality for a while? Are they deep in it? Are they new to like mindfulness in general? Like where are they at? It's interesting because there's a mix, right? And that's the cool part, right? Because spirituality is so subjective, man, right? It's like, yeah, they've done the mindfulness and the meditation, and, or maybe they didn't do any of it, right? But maybe they've been in a church for 10 years. And that's been their spiritual experience has been a part of the, the church for 10 years and they haven't done meditation. They haven't done mindfulness. They haven't done breath work, but they're receiving just as much value and benefit as the person who's been meditating for 10 years. Oh yeah. Because totally. the subjectivity of it, right. I would say where they're at is they want to do something great, but they know that only it's it only themselves is standing in the way. They know that they're the least common denominator of their block <laughs> and they're willing to do something about it, right? No matter where they're at on their journey, they know that their business will not be successful and they'll not, they're not making the money that they want to make. They're not getting the clients they want to work with. They are not creating the impact that their heart really desires because their mind is standing in the way and their stories and their, you know, supporting evidences, right? If that's even a thing, right? The supporting evidence is the thing standing in the way. Mm -hmm. And those things live in the darkness. And that's where I kind of come in. That sounds like an awesome niche for you. We, we haven't uh, caught up since you've uh, found that. So uh, that's good to hear. I love that. Yeah, man. And, and dude, the results and the takeaways and the feedback, like I just did a closing keynote in Mexico back in January. Nice. And the feedback from that, man, like everybody was talking about how excited they were nice. to go into their darkness. And I was like, yes, like that's it. Yeah. Like that's it. Like get excited, but don't get lost in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Get excited, but don't get lost in it. So let's uh, talk about another thing. Uh, you mentioned like your writing style is like uh, poetic. And there's a line I wrote down that I just loved. It's rage is anger who lost its way. Mm -hmm. Rage. Rage is anger who lost its way. Talk to us about sacred rage. What is sacred mm. rage and what are some practices for sacred rage? Yeah, man. So I explain it much differently in the book. <laughs> it's very poetic. Again, I whatever's coming through right now, say is word good. for yeah. word, right? Yeah. And I just want to place that context because yeah. for me today, right? Sacred rage to me today is the thing that both makes me insane and impactful and influential. It's the thing that lives inside of me that fuels my desire for change. Because if I didn't care about it, I wouldn't get mad about it. If I'm mad about something, then there's something inside of me that says, I'm so mad about this and I want to do something about it. Because when anger evolves, it turns into willpower. And the quote that you mentioned that, 
Rage is anger who lost its way. It's when we don't honor the anger. It's when we don't move the anger. It's when we don't do something about it that only it becomes rage because that is what, ang what rage is. It's anger when it's suppressed at its deepest level. It's like anger and resentment had a baby and rage is born. Mm -hmm. And we don't resent the world. We resent ourselves for not doing something about it. And at that point, it doesn't become sacred. It becomes secret. And when rage becomes secret, it goes to other things like hurting self or hurting others. That's what rage unprocessed can, can look like. Well so said. <laughs> yeah and like anger is my baseline right like i was born and bred as a fighter yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> just so everyone knows i read in your book that you learned to fight or you're being trained to fight at five years old and when i read that i was like oh i i see nathan so much more clearly now and i understand him so much more just with knowing that that makes sense <laughs> yeah like i was a, i was a martial artist by the time i was five years old man yeah and it wasn't like martial arts like um, like Kung Fu. It wasn't, um, Qigong. It wasn't like Tai Chi, right? It was American Cobra Kempo, Kai, which is like one of the most aggressive martial arts you can do. And not to mention that my sensei slash Sifu, Greg Medford, shout out to that guy. He was like, he used to be in the Marine Corps. I don't know what he did in the Marines, but I'm just assuming it was something dangerous because <laughs> the way this man trained me, like he treated me like a grown man when I was five. He started making bets with me when I was like eight years old that I couldn't do a hundred pushups. And that was the only way I was going to get a belt. So at eight year old, guess what I did? hundred pushups. And that's like the anti-authoritarian in me, which is like, yeah, you think I can't do it? Watch me. And then I'm like, oh, wait, that set me up really well for the like, next 23 years. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. You're basically in Cobra Kai. Yeah, pretty that, much, dude. That's what it sounds like. Have yeah. you seen the show Cobra Kai? Yes, that's exactly oh what kind of what it was like. So good. It's <laughs> yeah. so good. I started watching that during my yoga teacher training and hearing these different spiritual teachers uh, reference the Karate Kid. And then I went back and watched the Karate Kid and I was like, oh, I'll check out this Cobra guy. But uh, yeah, man, that makes so much sense. So in terms of like safely letting that anger out so it doesn't turn into rage, what are some good practices? Yeah. So a lot of the practices that I would use with clients, one is called the hand scream, where you literally just like you get in a power stance, you put your feet like hip width apart, like you take your hands, right? And you kind of like people can't see this, but you put one hand on top of the other and then you just co cover your mouth. Mm -hmm. like this, or you're talking like this, but you can still bring it out of your nose. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you just take a deep breath into your nose and you just like and you just shake back and forth and scream into your hand. And the thing is, is not to keep doing it again and again and again and again and again. It's like, that's a super simple tool. So that way, when you're angry and you're just like, nobody's around, I'm angry. I don't want to like punch a wall, right? If you feel like you're going to punch a wall, if you're going to say something mean, if you're going to react to that text message, if you're going to write a really hateful email to your ex, if you're going to... <laughs> Chat GPT at first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that one. I would say hand screen, then Chat GPT it. Because <laughs> your mind's going to be a lot more clear, right? And what just, did you say hand what? It's like a hand scream, right? So think of like pillow oh, screaming. Oh, I, I see. Oh, okay. Do the exercise, then write, then chat GPT it, then go over <laughs> again, wordsmith it, and then sit on it and then send it. That's pretty much the process. <laughs> or don't send it at all because you yeah. normally just write it all out and you're like, no, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> and just stay angry I and saved in my notes. Yeah, save in my draft. Well, I have it there in case I ever need to go back to it or I need to revisit that for any reason. But yeah, yeah. it does feel better not sending it. <laughs> For yeah, sure. I have like 37 emails saved in my drafts to my ex-wife and I just don't send it. Um, it right. would never end well, no matter how many times I chat GPT it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've learned my lesson, but kind of back to the topic at hand, right? <laughs> I sure. mean, hand screaming, like that's cool. That's what I use with clients a lot easier when you can like demonstrate it and show them. Um, you know, but another one thing, dude, it's so simple. It's stupid to just like go in your room and scream in a fucking pillow. Like just go in your room, scream in a pillow, right? Get it out one, two, three, seven times if you have to. And then all you do is you just flip back over on your back and you just lay down. And you're just like, wow. Oh, how fucking good it feels to just like be angry and express that anger and not hurt myself and not hurt anybody else, right? By doing that exercise, you are actually maturing it into willpower. Because you're recognizing that you're angry and you're doing something about it instead of unconsciously projecting it onto the world. 
or like pushing it I down it. and hurting yourself, right? Because like holding on to it is hurting yourself. So is, like is just there, get it out. Is there anything you've done with your work with men's work and sacred sons with sacred rage where like you're gathered in community? Because by the way, guys, uh, Nathan is a men's work leader as well well and sacred sons is one of the top like men's work uh, organizations and he runs their chapter experiences in arizona or something similar like that he's legit put it that way um so is there any like thing you do with men in groups together with sacred rage yeah i mean done it with men i've done it with men and women i've done it with men and women here in arizona with my friend poppy um, we've led, co led co-ed experiences, um, but in Rising Brotherhood here in Arizona, and then in Sacred Sons, which is more international, I would say, we have an exercise called like pre primal recalibration. And it doesn't always have to be rage, but it just often comes up, um, which I can't divulge all those details. If you want to find out, then like come to an event, hit me up. Um, I'll send Sam a link. <laughs> you can check it out. Right, yeah, please but, do so I can put in the show notes. It'll be in the show notes 100%. when you're listening. Yeah, yeah, because in, in those experiences, man, it's one thing to be angry by yourself. And it's a whole other thing to be angry in the witness of others, someone else. Mm. Like when someone else can see you angry and not be scared of the monster inside of you, something happens, right? And I actually experienced that in combo when I was down in Peru sitting with ayahuasca with the mastermind that I was in called One Infinity with my coach, Adam Roa, and then Gerard Adams. And in that combo ceremony, man, that was the first time, and that reel is actually on my Instagram. That was the first time I was, I ever purged like deep anger, like, deep and it's on my anger. Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, someone managed to catch a video and it just became yeah. a thing. Holy. And it's one of my most viewed videos because like, it's, it's not staged. It's real. Yeah. Like yeah. I didn't know somebody was recording. Yeah. And yeah. it just happened. But then I just collapsed into tears. I just like collapsed into tears, man. And I just remember laying down being at such peace. And then I opened my eyes and the first person I see is Brandon Collinsworth, who's a really fucking amazing human being. And, you know, he was the one who kind of guided us down there and he has his own experiences called warrior retreats. Highly recommend Brandon Collinsworth. Hmm. And man, like I just saw his face and then I saw Adam's face. And then I saw Gerard's face and then I saw Chelsea and I saw all these people who loved me, even though what I just did was to me so ugly, but like they were just looking at me and smiling, right? It just brought this like sense of relief that I've never experienced, right? Because it was both with men and women. It's one mm -hmm. thing to do it in a men's, in a men's circle. It's one thing for other men to see it because most men can relate. It's like, yeah, dude. I'm angry too. A lot of time, anger is my baseline. I'm angry at the world. I'm angry at myself. I'm angry at my wife. I'm angry at everything. You know, it's really common. But to be there in ceremony with women too, and for them to still look at me and love me, like that was different, bro. Like that was different. So there is like this dance between being by this yourself, being in a group of your own gender, of your own kind. And then there's the other aspect of being in relationship and being in the presence of everyone, right? And, and the concept of sacred rage, <laughs> the main concept is like, fuck the shame of being the same. Like let that rage flow through you. So that way people can actually see you for who you are. Because that's the very thing that we tuck away the most in my opinion is rage. We tuck away rage because most men are afraid of being seen as dangerous or that they're going to get in trouble or that they're going to get locked up or that they're going to be seen as this like demon of society. And then most women, they think that they're going to be called a bitch. Or they're going to be seen as being overdramatic or they're going to be seen as being too much or that they're all of themselves are not welcome in the world when that's simply just not true. That's simply just not true because we live in a society where rage isn't welcome, but how do you think society was built? Yeah. Rage, anger, violence. It's kind of what humanity has been doing since the dawn of time. Every single civilization that you see has come from what? Violence. 
And to your War. point, the reason why we're talking about this is let out that anger so it doesn't turn into rage it, because when we suppress it, then that happens. And thank you for going there and sharing that with community because that's what, what I was trying to get at. And I really think that it's so powerful in community. Have you heard of the, the breath work? I don't know uh, uh, what to call it. The breath work style uh, called transformational breath. Yeah, I actually did it with Stephanos. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that's where I started doing breath work or the style I started with. And the toning and transformational breath when you're like throwing, throwing a little temper tantrum, uh, banging your feet in your arms, and then pushing your, your legs on the instructor's like chest and then uh, toning, like pretty much screaming. For mm -hmm. me, that was what made breath work so powerful. And when I asked you earlier, like, what do you do differently in your breath work journeys? I totally forgot that I used to do this because I haven't been doing it this year. But last year, when I was going through my own stuff, I started theming a few breathwork journeys around sacred rage. And I would bring in, you know, toning from transformational breath that I learned and di different things like that that I just described. And what I find personally is like when one person goes, Ah, and just like lets it out like that's really what gives us all permission to like let go because i know like if i don't do that in a breathwork journey people might like not go as hard and like you said they have their foot on the gas or the brakes which that's cool sometimes you don't want to go as deep you just need something more restful that's cool but like if you really want to go deep my my like coming out party in in breath work with a sacred rage practice which was actually at Raven's Eye. Have you been to Sless Old House in Malibu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we did uh, Fit for Service Malibu 2018. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so um, th for everyone listening, this house is in Malibu. It's a straight-up castle and just like bricks out there. And over uh, overview of the ocean in Malibu, it's in incredible so we're doing a full immersion like a lot of uh the deep cathartic work and i kicked it off with breath work and it was so powerful for me because i had been in that house leading different forms of healing it was the first time i went from like an assistant to like a leader and to be seen by like the person that was like teaching and training me and then kick off the day of healing. And man, there's one photo you might've seen me post it online at one point where I'm just like, <laughs> you know, just like a monster. And I think for two days after that, I couldn't even really speak because I gave it my all. And I think that's part of the reason why I stopped doing that as much because I would really like lose my voice a lot when I would like cue it. And I could feel like I almost felt like I would be on medicine and right there with them just from like the toning alone. So it's a incredible practice. I mean, if you want to have a voice like mine, just scream every day for like three years, you'll be fine. <laughs> all, right, all right, cool. <laughs> like, into you have the a great voice. It's like, do you know how much screaming and smoking of substances went into this voice? A lot. <laughs> all right, let's get into some interesting stuff here. So one of the things that I heard you say earlier about like you're insane something, you have, uh, your podcast is called what? Spiritual Psychopath? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like, you will be the first to say like, you're a psychopath or, or like, I'm a psychopath or I'm insane or this type of stuff. And I tell people the opposite. I'm like, <laughs> instead of like even using the word crazy, it's say wild, you know, like talk to us why you feel it's so important for you to embrace these words like insane and psychopath. Yeah. I mean, they're just words, dude. You know, it's <laughs> like, they're just words, right? Like words carry power. And, you know, your spells are spelling and spelling are spells. Like we know these notions and we know that whatever we speak out, like we are going to face. And for me, man, like I want to embrace my psychopath because that is the part of me that will hurt someone if it's not seen. That's the part of me that will do a lot of damage in the world if I don't have a relationship to it. And I think that's the important piece. Because even in what we would consider shadow work, right? And Carl Jung talks about this, is that anything that we deny, repress, or avoid becomes the very thing that creates in fundamental decisions. But right? let's unpack the story of uh, why is Nathan 
a psychopath because I don't see you as a psychopath. Like you run with that label and I'm like, it's probably stuff in your past. I mean, I read some of your book. I've hear some of it, but like from what I've seen in knowing you for four, four years now, like I don't see Nathan as a psychopath. So wh why is Nathan a psychopath? So what people don't know about me is that I have many voices in my head, right? Not enough to be institutionalized, right? But the therapy world would call it internal family systems, right? And in these internal family systems of Nathan, I have more than just defenders and firefighters and protectors. I have a psychopath. I have an abuser. I have a wild man. I have a magician. I have a mystic. I have a warlock, right? I've just dissected my psyche in so many different ways to the point where I can distinguish the subtle voices in my head and to not have a relationship to the craziest, most insane psychopathic part of me is to also disregard the most creative and inspiring part of me because I, only a psychopath like me would come up with and create the things that I have would only choose to embark on different journeys. Like who spends a hundred thousand dollars on a mastermind goes and drinks ayahuasca for three days, does combo, smokes bufo, and completely rips their reality to shreds, right? A psychopath does. Somebody who is so <laughs> crazy to go all in on life to be the most authentic version of themselves. So when I say spiritual psychopath, number one, it's a branding move. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a great branding move. Everybody loves it. And that's because it gives people permission right? To say that I'm a psychopath gives per people permission to embrace their crazy. Because when somebody says I'm crazy or I'm insane or I'm race, you're crazy. That's a good tagline. Yeah, dude. Yeah. I actually just came up with that. So I'm going to make that. Yeah. Write that <laughs> down. Embrace your crazy, you know, like embrace your crazy, right? Because that yeah. same crazy is this thing that everybody wants to know. Everybody wants to see. And it's until we like showcase and demonstrate, not perform, that part of us, but demonstrate to actually showcase it to the world. That's the part of us that is the most authentic version of self, right? If I were to sit here and say I'm a psychopath because of my past and the crazy things I've done, that would be a story. Mm -hmm. No, I'm a psychopath because I do crazy shit. I do stuff that some people can't even fathom for the sake of just learning to be myself, to, to just want to be seen for who the fuck I am without any judgment or any shame or any confined space that society has created you know like that's what i mean in sacred rage like fuck the shame of being the same because i tried to be the same as everybody else for so long and it got me fucking nowhere it just made me more angry because i wasn't like anybody else and i don't think anybody is like anybody else and i think that is embracing the true creative artist in every single one of us right if your word is to be an artist be an artist my word for an artist is a psychopath <laughs> They're just words. And, and the meaning of psychopath to me was actually rooted in Wilhelm Reich's work. And the psychopath leader is an actual archetype. It's a character. So if I am actually the embodiment of my psychopath, that is actually me being so crazy enough to lead the movements that I am, that I can fully embrace it. And that embracement becomes the gateway to me becoming the leader that I know I am in the world. Yeah, this uh, Steve Jobs quotes coming up for me, the ones who think they're crazy enough to change the world, blah, 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 something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The ones so, who are crazy enough, the ones who call themselves think they're crazy enough, they're the ones who actually change the world. Yeah. They actually do it. You know, right. they're the ones making the risks. They're taking the risks. They're They're choosing the more uncomfortable parts of life. They're literally going into the darkest parts of themselves. And they're mm -hmm. testing themselves too, right? All the work that I've done, for some reason, I think I still have the willpower to walk into a bar and not fall into old behaviors when that simply isn't true either. I just have a different perspective about it. And I try to do 1% better every time, even though now I'm fully sober. Like, don't even mess with like kava, kratom, nothing. No psychedelics, nothing. Oh, no psychedelics, huh? Nothing. Oh, wow. Right? This is the longest I've ever been fully, truly sober. How long is psychedelics. that? Been? Like 47, 48 days today. Nice. Like I'm in the high forties. Thank yeah. you. And it's the most clear I've ever felt. You know, I want to tell you about this app and for the listeners, for anyone listening, but I just heard about it the other day. It's called grounded. Have you heard of it? I have not. Yeah. I was uh, with someone, a uh, group of people and this one woman said who I just met, she said she had been um, 
a cannabis user her whole life and she's like 57 years old or something and she's I think three months or something uh off of cannabis and she's using an app called grounded and basically like it shows you an acorn and then each day the acorn sprouts and then it eventually turns into an oak tree and it's got all the yeah it sounds really dope <laughs> what yeah, so I downloaded it. I haven't checked it out yet. It's called Grounded. If you guys want to write it down and check it out later, um, here, welcome to Ground. I just opened it up. Welcome to Ground. We're happy you chose us to help you quit cannabis or take a tolerance break. I mean, obviously, it could be for anything, right? But I'm going to check that out at some point. You know, there's two topics that are coming up from my long laundry list of uh, notes that I wanted to touch on as we're already like over an hour here. But in your book, you wrote that you've been diagnosed with 31 conditions. Could you share some of those with us? Because you didn't share in the book. Yeah, yeah. So I was medically discharged from the military, 2016. Um, primary diagnosis that I was discharged for was bilateral exertional compartment syndrome, which is basically just a fancy way of saying that your legs really hurt to the point where you cannot function. And in the military, if you can't run, you can't fight. If you can't run, you can't shoot. If you can't run, you can't carry somebody's body if you need to. And throughout that medical discharge process, I was seen and assessed. And I ended up getting diagnosed with 31 different conditions, right? Instead of PTSD, because there was no record of combat, which a lot of veterans like. Oh, come on. Like you can get PTSD <laughs> yeah, from exactly. anything. No, Okay, whatever. Leave that. Right, up. exactly. Yeah. But instead... But instead, they mm -hmm. diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder with a series of panic attacks up to twice per week. Um, major depressive disorder, insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, because I was 242 pounds. Um, that's when I was actually bodybuilding. Yeah, I was actually a professional bodybuilder in 2016. I know that, but how much do you weigh now? Because you're not that tall or anything. 205. How much? Six, I'm you, six how, foot 205. You're six foot? <laughs> Yeah, bro. All right. Maybe I'm taller than 5'10 because I don't feel like I'm looking up when I see you. Uh, all right. Six foot. Cool. You know, I see your six foot. I mean, I was up to 253, right? And then my hand injury in 2017, which was like- 253 is still massive. Like that's, yeah. that's still really big. Yeah. I was also on like six different steroids, steroids and growth yeah. hormone and like all kinds of things to do yeah, to yeah. get the pro card, to get the, get the nice shiny trophy and stand on stage and everybody claps, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anything for that. And now I'm, you know, suffering years and years later from, you know, hormonal and, you know, uh, filtration issues, we'll call it. And I'm still figuring that out to this day, right? Like long-term adverse effects of that, you know, and that was, I mean, we're looking at eight years ago. So there are adverse effects to that. So anybody listening, you're doing steroids. I would highly consider going to a doctor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's that yeah. documentary where, with uh, Ronnie Coleman where he's basically like crippled. Yeah. 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 More than that. beyond the physical body, man. Like my liver, like they wanted to take out my liver at 24. They wanted, Jeez. they said I had an acute kidney injury or not a let, not take my liver out, but transplant. They wanted to take out one of my kidneys. They saw that like my, um, all my levels were fucked, like just completely fucked. It was not worth it whatsoever, you know, but kind of back to the diagnosis pieces, right, like right. everything from tinnitus to ringing in my ears to um, ED to insomnia to obstructive sleep apnea, like everything under the sun that I got diagnosed with, I ended up getting out with 31 diagnosed conditions, which contributed overall to a 100% disability rating, right? So I'm technically hundred percent permanently and totally disabled by the VA now. And that impacted me for a really long time because doctors said I would never be the same, that I would never be able to function without medication, that I would never really live a normal life again. And that really sucked. And thank God for fitness, right? That's why I went into the fitness industry afterwards, because I wanted to learn how to properly take care of my body. And then over time, I started realizing like, oh, like trauma and psychosomatic conditions manifest as certain things in the body. And I'm just now learning eight years later, that my compartment syndrome was actually me running for my entire life, not fighting my entire life. I'm just now learning that. I just put those two pieces together like two days ago in a conversation. Amazing. That this compartment syndrome in my calves, which is 
apparently an overuse injury of the of the calves of like consistently pushing my body harder than I should has been from me running my entire fucking life. Wow. You know? And to have the awareness of that now, it's like, cool, my shadow work is to just sit down and not run anywhere, not run to the tool, not run to the breath work, not run to the person to help me with this problem, but really sit with myself and let my body rest. Let my mind rest. Let my heart be at peace, right? And those 31 conditions were the bridge to help me get to where I'm at now. So although they were detrimental and they were, you know, limitations, we'll say like those limitations were the very thing that also paved the way for my liberations to come to life. Absolutely. Hell yeah, dude. And thank you for sharing all of that. It's absolutely incredible. And I think the fitness piece uh, that's been coming up for me a lot recently, just being like, I, I think I've been missing that personally from my healing journey, like truly in, in my body. And I started to hit recently and that like, it's one of the things I hate so much, you know, the heart rate and all that it's heated, it's a heated room, but it's also great. Like I did it yesterday and I feel so good now. Let's uh move on to behavior versus substance addictions. That is really interesting because I wrote in my book, Soul Life Balance, about behavior addictions. I didn't use that terminology, but like an addiction is an addiction, right? You know, and for me, like work uh, it became an addiction. And I'm so fascinated by your concept of exploring behavior versus substance addictions. Yeah. I mean, to me now, with, you know, going into AA rooms and CA rooms, and now for the first time in recovery, actually working with a sponsor because I've just surrendered my way and I'm embarking on a journey to learn better ways, right? Better ways for myself, better ways that I can be a more surrendered human, I guess, <laughs> right? Because if surrender to a blueprint other than yours is to trust. It's a, it's a true act of surrender. And to me, like I'm walking with God. I'm not walking with my sponsor. I'm not walking into these rooms acting like I have my shit together. I'm really not. Right. And I was too stubborn and too prideful for the last 14 years to even say, Hey, there could be value and benefit here. And the fact that I'm, a, I've been avoiding these rooms, the fact that I've been avoiding these conversations are the very invitations I need to be the man and the leader that I want to be, especially now that this book is out. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just want to preface that because what I'm about to say is what I learned in these rooms. Mm. And it's that when we talk about an alcoholic or an addict, whether it's an alcoholic, a sex addict, whether it's a hyper achiever, high performer, workaholic, right? We have a lot of uh, names and labels that are all talking about the same thing. And whether it's drugs, drinking, pills, powder, people, or patterns, they are oh, all one of the same. Mm -hmm. They're all one and the same. And I learned from being true to you, which is the training that I did my addiction recovery coaching and psychedelic psycho-spiritual integration training through. And I even quote them in my book that it's any ritualistic behavior that enchants our sensory desires that pulls us away from our true self. Mm -hmm. And as long as we have a drug, a drink, a pill, the powder, the people, the pattern, we don't actually have the opportunity to be with the wholeness of who we are because we're, we're always grabbing and grasping for the thing that lives outside of us. And that very thing is the very thing that helps us feel not like how we actually feel. Mm -hmm. right? You know what I mean? So when we talk about behaviors or substances or anything, right? It's just the recognition that we are already whole, right? We're already whole. And the addiction, the true addiction is the escaping of not feeling whole. Every pattern, every addiction lives and grows from disconnection. Like disconnection is the root of all addiction. And if we can understand that and understand that on a deep level, 
then we actually create a gateway and an opening to learning what it what it feels like and what it what it could be to just live and be ourselves all right and i'm just now learning that again cuz i can't go to training and get all the tools and get all the learning and all the knowledge if i'm not surrendering to someone else's blueprint or god's blueprint to say hey i'm here to receive a lesson for myself all right i'm here because i want to be better i want to be a better man i want to be a better father I'm going to be the better leader. And I can only do that if I put aside all the things that I think I know about myself, others in the world, and I receive freely and give freely what was once given to me, right? And all this that I'm sharing right now was freely given to me, right? Perspective is free. Perspective is free. Right. You can literally step outside and look around and change your perspective in a moment's notice. You don't need to buy a ticket to the zoo to get a perspective on what life feels like to be a caged animal, mm. just to reinforce that we're free. Wow. That's good. That's good. And going, going back to just this whole theme of what we've been talking about the past 10, 20 minutes or so, I'm not keeping track, but wanting a moment to be different than it is, right? Like what works for you? you to just be what i've been coming home to every time this shows up at least more recently is just pray mm. like the power of prayer you know because it's like if i want things to be different that inherently means i'm trying to control what happens and if i'm trying to control what happens then i'm not actually free i'm actually limiting the potential realities that exist before me so for me right now it's praying and saying God, universe, spirit, source, whatever universal pronoun you want to use for this thing, like help me see the truth today. All right. Help me set aside whatever I think I might know about myself, others in the world, so that the truth can actually be revealed to me. And no matter what choice I make, know that it's for my highest good. Know that it is for the highest good of humanity. And know that is the highest good that can happen today, right? And just like putting things down, man, and just setting it aside. And, you know, one thing that sticks with me is it's not about feeling better. It's about feeling more, right? The journey is less about feeling better and feeling more. And if I'm just on this constant pursuit of feeling better, right? Then what the hell is the difference between heroin and breath work? Mm -hmm. Nothing, right? It could be less substance but the feeling is still euphoria. The feeling I'm chasing is still euphoria or relief. Instead of just giving that pressure away to something greater than what my feeble human mind can even comprehend. Right? Because even in more of the ancient and indigenous ways, like the sky, the father is the mystery, right? Like the mystery in the sky, man. And to give something away to something that we can't even comprehend Tell me how that's not trust. Tell me how that's not surrender. Yeah. And, and tell me how that can't be the ultimate pathway to peace. You know? That's beautiful, brother. Thank you. I, this feels like a good place to uh, close it out, you know, with prayer and just being. And I think we've really gone a full circle here and, talked about a lot of things. I still have way more. I still have a lot more notes, which I guess means for you, all you guys listening, you're going to have to go to the show notes and click the link for Nathan's book between two worlds or check out his podcast, spiritual psychopath and all the different offerings. Nathan, dude, you're, you're such a awesome, awesome dude. I love dropping in with you. We don't always connect uh, a lot, but when we do, we always have such rich conversations I appreciate how you're showing up for yourself with authenticity for your family, your children, and everyone around you and being a leader and now a best-selling author. And at the beginning of your journey as a best-selling author and keynote speaker and cracking people open with breath work, with uh, darkness to darkness to Dharma. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I thought so. Yeah. Dude, thank you so much for coming on the pod. This has been great. It's been a longer one than typical. And I just appreciate you, man. Thank you, brother.